Gracious God, we are grateful to you for the gift of worship and to gather today in particular where we are reminded of your awesome power and your amazing love. And so, Lord, as we come to the time where we turn to your word, we pray that you would open up our ears, our minds, our hearts to hear your voice and to be changed by it. Lord, the passages will be familiar, the words will be familiar, but I pray that your gospel and your good news will fall on our ears and on our hearts freshly. May we leave here different than when we entered just a few moments ago. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Good morning again for myself and many others. The morning began early today with the sunrise service in the cemetery. If you've never been to that, you need to do that at least once. Could there be a more appropriate place for Easter service than in a cemetery? Isn't that the place where it all began, where the first Easter happened? And I love that setting of a seminary because uh, of a cemetery because it is a reverent place. It's a place where you're careful about where you walk and what you say. There's a sense of reverence and even holiness perhaps to it, but it's it's burdened. It's burdened with sadness. It's burdened with loss. And so what better place for hope to spark on Easter morning? than among the tombs. So here we are, it's Easter morning, we're gathered in this beautiful space, some of you voluntarily, some of you under compulsion, some of you out of curiosity. I have sympathy for all of you, no matter why you are here. But so many different reasons, so many different motivations, yet we are all here, and here we are. So whether you realize it or not, in God's providence, he has brought you here. He has brought each of us to this moment to pause and reflect on his son. Some of you are here because you want to be here and you know God wants you here. You're here to worship. This is what you do. Others of you, perhaps recently, perhaps in the weeks leading up to Easter, you have begun to feel the stirring of God's Spirit in your heart and soul, and you want to know more. You want to go deeper in your relationship with God. And then some of you, you may not know why you're here. You may have allowed yourself to be drug along to church this morning because it's easier to suffer in silence than it is to create a scene, right? especially on Easter Sunday. But you sense that something's up. Like a spark from a flint, you're feeling a faint but clear flicker of something more, something calling you to come closer, something that's about to ignite inside of you. And if that's you this morning, I want you to listen. I want you to be listening with your ears and with your heart because I believe that God has brought you here this morning to hear his word and to hear his truth. So this morning I want us to consider the word enough, the concept enough. So a basic definition says that it is an adequate quantity. It's as much as is necessary. It's sufficient for a specific purpose. Synonyms would be adequate, plenty, abundant, just right. Enough means something is satisfied. It's finished. Enough says, I don't need any more. And when we have enough, we experience contentment, satisfaction, fulfillment. When we don't have enough, we experience disappointment. Or dissatisfaction. And the opposite of that disappointment would be gluttony. The sin of not stopping once we have enough. So there are both quantitative and qualitative aspects of this concept. The quantitative will likely come up at some point today. You may find yourself saying something like, that's enough candy for one day, kids? 
Maybe you'll have to say that to your spouse or to an adult in your house. Are there enough chairs around the table? Have you had enough to eat? That's enough politics at the dinner table. You get the idea. Do we have enough money to buy that thing, enough time to make it to the baseball field? It's a quantity or number that satisfies some standard. It's the right amount, the correct sum total. But there's also the aspect of enough that is qualitative. This leans more into its definition as perfection or fulfillment, satisfaction. Is my effort going to be good enough for the task at hand? Am I smart enough to pass the exam? Am I good enough to make the team? Am I enough? Am I enough? So our culture sends us conflicting messages over this. In one sense, it tells us that you are enough. I am enough. But it also tells us that, unfortunately, well, you're not. So that we have to keep chasing whatever it is that they want us to chase. We're not good enough to make the team. Unless we buy certain brands or begin using the latest gym equipment. We're not beautiful enough, so we need to buy particular clothes or do other measures with our body. We're not smart enough, so we need to outsource responsibility. We're not happy enough, but we would be if only we would spend money like we want to. Not rich enough to be satisfied, but if we work more, work harder, work longer, then maybe, maybe we could be. It always wants us looking inwards for satisfaction, but always wants us disappointed at what we actually find. It always wants us craving the next thing that might fix it for us. So we end up like tires spinning in the mud. We're working really hard to figure it out. We're working really hard to become enough, but we're not going anywhere, and we're stuck in these questions of, am I enough? Am I good enough? Am I beautiful enough? So for us as Christians, today obviously is the most important day in history. It is the key to unlocking history itself. So this question and conundrum of, am I enough? It can't be answered until we've considered the question of Jesus. Is Jesus enough? Was his death and resurrection enough to win the battle against the devil? Is Jesus strong enough to overcome the darkness in our world, but perhaps even more difficult, is he strong enough to overcome the darkness that I know is in my heart that is entrenched there? Is his love for me enough? So I want you to keep those questions in mind as we turn to our text this morning in Colossians. So Paul wrote that letter to the church in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, around 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. Now keep in mind, that was 30 years, 30 years, one generation after Jesus' resurrection. There was no church buildings, there were no church buildings there, there was no Uh, Christian culture, there were no Christian schools. This church was meeting in someone's house, meeting in someone's house, and they were the only Christians in the city. There had not been a significant Christian marriage. They were the only ones in the city. Now, almost all of you had to pass at least one or two churches on your way here, if not a dozen or more. For them, this was the only option. Some guy's living room. That's where the church met. So everyone else in the city, they worshiped as many gods as they want. Greek gods, Roman gods, however many they want, whichever ones they wanted. So in this letter, what Paul is wanting the young believers to do, and when I say young believers, I don't mean believers who are youthful, but they're young believers in the sense that they're new to Jesus. They're new to Christianity. So whatever age they were, what he's wanting to do for them is to take their eyes off of the distractions and craziness of their culture around them and instead to behold the wonder of Jesus. To behold the wonder and beauty of Jesus. And so it's at the beginning of the letter that we get this beautiful passage to focus us 
on the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So you can follow along in your Bibles or on the screen as I read the passage aloud. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in our passage, Paul is wanting the young believers to behold the wonder of Jesus, and he progresses from the broadest to the most specific. So you can think of the shape of our passage like an inverted triangle. He begins talking about the creation, the entire creation from the forest floor to the farthest galaxy. Then he progresses to the church, God's people, and finally to the individual, you and me. So let's look at the, how the passage progresses. So in the first part, he draws our attention to Jesus' supremacy over all of creation. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn over all creation. In other words, he is the visual representation of the one true God. Human beings, we too, we bear the image of God, but it's, it's limited and it is stained by sin. But Jesus, on the other hand, he is the perfect image, the satisfactory likeness, the only one of God. John Calvin said that in Christ, God shows us his righteousness, his goodness, his wisdom, his power. In short, he shows us his very self. Verse 19 says that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. He's not a partial representation of God. He is a full representation of God. When we think of Jesus, he's not 50% human and 50% God. He is 100% both. You see, Paul is wanting to communicate clearly that Jesus is not just another human. He's not just another average Joe. He's not just some guy that you heard about on the news who has a cult in the woods. Jesus is the real deal. Paul continues, verse 16, he writes, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. And for him. In Jesus, everything was created. Everything. Everything in heaven, everything on earth. Everything visible, everything invisible. Every throne, every power, every ruler, every authority from the Roman Empire to the American Empire, everything that came before, came between, and is coming afterwards. Christ has majesty and power over them all, whatever shape they take. You see, Paul is establishing that there is no sphere in creation over which Jesus is not sovereign. 
There is not a square inch of creation. There is not a dark corner of the spiritual world where anyone or anything can hide from him or be out of his control. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus is like this divine glue that holds everything together. He's active in upholding and maintaining the created order. Perhaps you've heard of a philosophical system before called deism. Deism says that God created the universe, he created everything, set it in motion, and then walked away from it. And just let it go. That is not what the Bible teaches. Our creator God is active and engaged in the world he has made. He is the controlling principle of all creation. He is the basic operating principle, controlling existence. He's more than just the force that preserves the orderly arrangement of the cosmos. He is its rationale. He is its rhyme and its reason. Now, if someone looks around at creation, if you drive to the beach and you watch the sunrise over the waves or you go to the mountains and you see the glory and majesty of the mountains and the stars in the sky, you you may arrive at the conclusion that there is a creator God. But the only way to actually know who that God is and to know what he's been doing in history, what he's doing in the present and what he'll do in the future is through Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So in verse 18, Paul narrows the scope from being Lord of all creation to being Lord of God's people. He says, Jesus is the head of the body, he's the head of the church, so us gathered here. So for all of creation, he's the operating principle, the rationale, the rhyme, the reason, but even for us, Here in the room, he is the same. He is the head. In other words, he is the source of life. He is the leader, the Lord, the king who commands the rest of the body. Now, my kids like to remind me when I remind them that I have a doctorate. They're like, well, you don't have a helpful doctorate is usually what they say. It's not a medical doctorate, but I feel pretty confident in saying that You know, if you lose fingers and toes, arms and legs, you can survive. But if you lose your head, you can't survive from that. I'm pretty confident about that. You need your head to live. It's the source of life and direction for the rest of the body. Jesus is the head of the church. Everything in the life of the church flows not from a pulpit or a choir loft or from a platform or a stage, but from Jesus. We are completely dependent on him. And without him, we are just a cold, lifeless corpse. Not only that, but he is the first one of us. He is the firstborn from the dead. In other words, his resurrection that we mark today is the inaugural resurrection, sealing for us victory over death, that we will one day be resurrected with him. So the world does not know just how intricately Jesus is involved in his creation, but we do. We do, and we live that out in our life as believers in community. We experience his life-giving leadership as his people. So let's pause and look at where we've come thus far. So Jesus is enough for all of creation, all the cosmos. He sustains it, he orders it, he's still at work upholding it. He is enough for everything spanning from this place right here all the way out to the farthest reaches of the farthest galaxy. Jesus is also enough for his people, the church, us. He is our head, our source of life, the one who sustains his people. And our final verses bring us to the most intimate and personal level of this. You and me. Is he enough for you and for me? Colossians verse 21, this comes from the message. 
It says, at one time you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. Isn't that beautiful? Whole and holy. In other words, Jesus' work on the cross was enough. He is enough for the universe. He is enough for the church. And he is enough for you. What he did for you was enough. What he did on the cross was enough to cover your sins and mistakes, to cover your cutting words, your abusive actions, your dark thoughts that no one else knows you have, your lust, your anger, your anxiety, your disappointment. Jesus' victory was enough to break the power of all that darkness that was impossible to overcome, overcome on your own before him. And then verse 23 says we must continue in faith, established and firm, not moving from the hope held out in the gospel. In other words, we need to lay hold of it and not let it go. Though the nations are in uproar, though the earth and heaven shake around us, no matter how much our culture tries to lure us away with distraction after distraction, Though the devil wants to pry our grip from this truth, hold fast, stand firm, cling with white knuckles to this truth that Christ is enough. This morning as we were in the cemetery and we were preparing for the sunrise service, we found out that one of our dear charter members, Clem Clark, passed away yesterday. Around 65 years ago, a group of people were called by God and moved by God that the gospel needed to be planted here in Mandarin. The good news needed to be planted here. Clem was among that group. Clem loved Easter Sunday. She loved the sunrise service in the cemetery. She was there year after year. Her son Chuck was there on the second row this morning. Clem heard this same message, this same truth, year after year, over 60 Easter Sundays. And I bet it never got old. What about you? Do you need to be reminded of this truth? That Jesus is enough. Even in our darkest hour, even in our loss, Jesus is enough. The grave that seems like it can never be satisfied, Jesus satisfied that appetite of death. He paid the price for us to be in relationship with him. Jesus is enough. His love is enough for you. His grace is enough. His forgiveness is enough. His power is enough. And his power is important because it means that all of this is true. It means we aren't just blowing smoke up here. It means the cross and the empty tomb are not smoke and mirrors. Easter is not some elaborate ruse to make Jesus seem like someone that he is not. He is the living Savior, the one through whom all things were created and in whom all things still hold together. Jesus is the operating system that you were designed to be fulfilled in. He is the garden in which you grow and you thrive. He is the river of life who quenches your thirst, the bread of life that satisfies your deepest hunger. He is the fire that burns through your darkest night. Jesus is enough. That is the Easter message. That the God who knows every star in the sky, because he created them, 
Even the stars that have yet to be in the sky, he knows them. He also knows you. He doesn't just know your name. He knows your heart. He knows you through and through, and he loves you. And he wants to call you his son and his daughter. If we would just lay hold of this truth that he is enough. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and almighty God, what a privilege it is to come today and to direct our attention to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you are enough, that you did for us what we could never do for ourselves. You secured eternal life. You overcame sin and death. And Lord, we still live in brokenness. We still live in a broken world. We still grieve the loss of mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus, you brought hope. And so our hope is in you. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And so, Lord, as we move into the day with all of its glitz and glamour, with all of the production of feasts and hospitality, Lord, sow these seeds in our heart and our mind that we may return to them. And remember your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.